So I'm going to do Sutta number 55, the many kinds of feeling. 59, excuse me. Um, <coughs> you notice there's not an S behind it. It is feeling, not feelings. So there is a mistake in the Majjhima Nikaya when it's talking about the Satipatthana Sutta because it says feelings. And that has a tendency to make you go off and not really understand that it has nothing to do with emotion. Now, I, I give the definition of feeling as excuse me, I'm still trying to catch up. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant. Now, the thing that you really need to understand is that feeling is not only talking about physical feeling. That's the way it's described in a lot of people that are teaching Satipatthana. But it's physical and it's mental. Why? because there's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling in emotion as well as in physical form. I know that there's some people that are really, really interested just in the physical form of feeling and they miss half of the boat when they get to looking at only physical feeling. But feeling isn't strictly mental or physical. Feeling is feeling. And that causes when the feeling arises right after that craving arises, I like it or I don't like it. It's pleasant or it's painful. So, I want to go through this, this sutta again so that you can understand a little bit more clearly that this is involving all different kinds of feeling. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pindika's Park. Then the carpenter Panjakanga went to the Venerable Udayan. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One? Three kinds have been stated by the Blessed One. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayan. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Pleasant feeling and painful feeling. That's generally when I'm talking about your meditation. I'm just talking about that. I'm not talking about the neutral feeling. Until you get to having equanimity, then, then I start throwing in that kind of feeling. But I don't tell you that it's a feeling. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. <clears throat> uh, 
A second time and a third time the Venerable Udayan stated his position. A second and third time the carpenter Panchakanga stated his. But the Venerable Udayan could not convince the carpenter Panchakanga, nor could the carpenter Panchakanga convince Venerable Udayan. Uh, Panjakanga was a, a carpenter, but he was like the handyman to have around. Every center has its own handyman that takes care of things. So he was around a lot for the Buddha's talks, so he, and he was very well educated. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him. He sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between the Venerable Udayan and the Carpenter Panjakanga. When he had finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it is actually a true presentation that the carpenter Panjakanga would not accept from Udayan. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayan would not accept from the carpenter Panjakanga. I've stated two kinds of feeling in one presentation. I have stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. Five kinds of feeling. Uh, I'm going to give it to you in Pali, then English. Sukha, Dukkha, Somanasa, Domanasa, and Upeka. That's pleasant or physical feeling, painful physical feeling, pleasant mental feeling, and painful mental feeling. And upeka is equanimity. So if, if you go to this book and you look at the footnotes, the footnotes were taken from a monk by the name of Buddha Gosa. And he did not understand about feelings. And he starts talking about feeling in, in a much different way. And didn't understand what those five kinds of feeling are. As a result, he didn't expound on these different kinds of feelings so that there was clear thought and clear understanding. And that has carried on through the commentaries. And that's one of the reasons that Buddha Gosa's work is somewhat suspect with his reasoning. He was not very good at guessing and he didn't study the suttas. He was a Pali scholar. He was taking notes from other people and translating it into Pali. So he can't be 100% the fault of the not understanding. But it has caused a lot of confusion uh, over time. The subtler kinds of feeling, the mental feelings, are difficult to recognize because you get caught up in that feeling and the dislike of that feeling as sadness, fear, anxiety, hatred, all of these different kinds of feeling sneak up on you very much. Now, this is one of the reasons that I want you to keep practicing daily, all the time, smiling. 
because that sharpens your mindfulness and you can start to see how your mind gets caught in these emotional feelings where you say something that can hurt yourself or someone else and then you justify in your own mind how you're right and they're wrong. All of that is part of feeling, but it's not recognized in, as anything other than this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. So it's real important for you to Begin keeping your mindfulness going in your daily activities. Keep, stay in a jhana as long as you possibly can. This is where your mind is pure. You don't have, you, you can still have painful mental feeling, but as soon as you notice that your mind is heavy, and you're not smiling and you're getting into dissatisfaction and dislike, you'll notice that more quickly and you can start using the six R's and let it go. Everything is part of a type of perception. And when you perceive that somebody has slighted you or you've done something that's not so nice to someone else, when you perceive that and then start forgiving yourself, forgiving that other person, especially forgiving yourself for getting caught again in the old habit of what you've been doing your whole life. <coughs> Excuse me. So you start developing new habits when you let go of the perception of uh, trying to let off dislike of what's happening to you. Oh, I got to let this steam off. That, that in itself is funny that you got caught and you don't even see it yet. And then you start saying things to other people that are hurtful. So it's really important that you keep your smile going all the time. Keep the smile in your mind. Don't criticize yourself when you forgot. Just laugh at that and start again. Okay. Over a few short months, people will start noticing that you are changing. You don't get so uh, upset. You don't get so caught in the emotional part of feeling. There is always, as soon as feeling arises, I don't care whether it's pleasant or painful, right after that, there's the I like it or I don't like it mind. Feeling is the very key to remember to relax and smile and bring that to whatever you're doing while you're doing it. Keep the smile going. Okay, I have stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. So the first five, it's really talking about the five, it's naming that there is pleasant and unpleasant physical, there's pleasant and un unpleasant mental. Now it's getting into the sense doors, the six sense doors. 
the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, body, and mind. Mind is the one you got to really watch out for. Because it always starts in mind. And after a few months of catching yourself and using the six R's of smiling and being in a jhana with your daily activities, it will start to turn into a good habit where you don't get caught by emotional upsets. They're still going to happen. There's still going to be times when there's great sadness that comes. Somebody in your family is hurt or uh, dies. There's sadness there. But the thing is, that's a time for you to be particularly alert with your mindfulness. Now, even though you can have sadness from somebody dying, it doesn't mean that you're hopeless and you can't do anything to help anybody else around you. That's a mistake that is made. If you focus on loving kindness and radiate that loving kindness to members of the family that are hurt, or close friends that are really painful because of that, that will help them overcome their grief more quickly. That will help you because you're not focusing on the grief that you have. You're wishing well to other people that you know are suffering the same way you are. So the more you can give your love to people that are suffering, even though it might not seem like it does any good at all, it does. And you start changing your world around you and this has a positive effect and your life becomes easier you're keeping your precepts without breaking them you're not getting into an emotional upset because of some kind of political nonsense that's going on You bring people back to the present moment so that they don't get caught up in their repeat thoughts of dislike and dissatisfaction. So the six kinds of feeling actually comes down to one mind on the on on the both the physical and the mental it comes down to your observation power so that you can see when your mind starts to get caught and then go into unwholesome states Okay, I have stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. What are the 18? Do you know? Well, we're breaking down these uh, six sense doors with pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. 
three with each of the six sense doors. That's 18. I have stated 36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. What are the 36? Past and present. Huh? Past, present. No. Oh, really? 18 times 2 is what? 36. <laughs> I have stated 108 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I'm not going to go to that because it takes a long time to describe it. That is that how the Dhamma has been shown by me in different presentations. When the Dhamma has thus been shown by me in different presentations, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others. They will take to quarreling, brawling, and disputing, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. I always like that description, verbal daggers. I've been in a room where people started arguing about things like this. Well, the Buddha said this. And the other one said, no, the Buddha didn't say that. He said this. And the Buddha said both. But they want to get into an argument. They get into their emotional upset and attachment. And this causes all kinds of problems. So you don't want to argue about Dhamma, about what is the right and what is the wrong. You just want to state your facts as you know them and then go to the suttas and see whether you're right or not. I know in Malaysia, there's major groups that they won't, this group won't have anything to do with that group because they're not teaching the same thing and they're wrong. They're not practicing Buddhism. They're practicing attachment and they have tight minds. They don't recognize the importance of being able to relax your mind. And they don't recognize the importance of <clears throat> letting go of perspectives that don't agree with you. I've had conversations with many different types of Buddhists and we don't argue. We don't try to convince each other that we're right and they're wrong. We state what we think is correct and then quietly listen to what they think is correct without fighting about it without playing that game of I know and you don't know. A lot of people don't see that as an attachment. They don't see that as craving. And as a result, they wind up hurting themselves and causing problems for other people. So, the more we can let go of that and actually accept what somebody else says and then go and check and see whether it's correct or not. That is the Buddha's way.
Okay, now we're going to go into the five chords of sensual pleasures. The sensual pleasures can be mental or physical or both. Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Now these are, they can be, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust, or it can be connected with sensual, divide, uh, sensual desire and invite hatred. Think about that. Because this is real feeling. Some sounds you hear and it's so... Uh, unpleasant, where does your mind go to? Or if it's one of your favorite songs, where does your mind go to? They still have that, I am that attached to it. And it's that way with all of the sensual desires or Odors cognizable by the nose. There's some smells that are really bad. You don't want to be around them. There's other smells that are really pleasant. So this can go either way. Flavors cognizable by the tongue. It's the same with tastes. Some tastes are really nice. Other tastes are not. But both of them are caught in sensual desire. They're caught in the I like it, I want it. Or I don't like it, I don't want it. It's still caught by craving. That's the danger of sensual desires. And they're... Uh, Tangibles cognizable by the body. There's pleasant feelings and there's painful feelings. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now that pleasure of, of joy that arises dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Should anyone say that's the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, <coughs> I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought. A lot of people ask me about thinking and examining thought and what that actually is. The thinking and examining thought is the verbal recitation of your wish for your spiritual friend and towards yourself. It's the verbal recitation, okay? With joy and happiness born of seclusion, this is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. 
Should anyone say this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, letting go of the verbalization of the wish in your mind. A monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence, stillness of mind, without thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of collectedness. This is that other kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than the previous. Now, when you get to the second jhana, if you stay with verbally making a wish, you'll start to get a headache because now you have to let go of all that verbalization. This is a very desirable state to be in during your daily activities, but there are times that you have to talk to other people. You talk to them kindly, you wish them well. And you're staying in that first jhana with the joy and the comfort of your mind without getting upset, without getting caught you start to have more and more confidence in knowing what you're doing while you're doing it. It's not just automatically happening. You're starting to see it more and more clearly. And you start to have more and more confidence that when you're radiating loving kindness to someone else, you're feeling that radiation and that happiness towards someone else, you start to see a change not only in yourself, but you start to see a change in other people around you. And now, not too long ago, I was in a restaurant where there were two people that were talking rather loudly and not happy with each other. So much so that the manager came old over and told them to quiet down. But the looks on their face was complete anger. So I saw that I was with someone else and I said, let's radiate some loving kindness to this couple. It was amazing to watch. It wasn't two minutes before they quieted down and they agreed to disagree on whatever it was that they were arguing about. And they actually started smiling and they started laughing. So I told the person that was with me, we've done our work here. Now we can go, go do something else someplace else. But to, to watch the transformation of your world around you when you have the mindfulness to remember to radiate loving kindness and send that compassion <coughs> to other people. Not taking sides with other people, not getting involved in what actually the, the whole problem was. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with what you have right now in the present and how you radiate loving kindness in the present. This helps you to stay in the second jhana. 
it helps you to have more uplifting joy. And you feel lighter in your mind. You feel lighter in your body. That's the kind of Vedana that the jhanas bring you. So it's real important for you to understand how you are teaching yourself and helping other people around you and you're teaching them, but they don't know that you're teaching them. Too many people have an idea that a teacher means that you only talk to people for a period of time and then go off and do whatever you want to do. No, you're your own teacher. You're teaching yourself how to recognize when your mind is distracted and what to do with that distraction as it's occurring. And that happens by your smiling. I know I harp on that a lot, but I do that for a good reason. I'm trying to help you with your mindfulness so that you'll be able to recognize when that smile goes away and you start getting caught in some other kind of disturbance. But when you have a lesson, like I just talked about, of being able to radiate loving kindness, I didn't know these people from Adam. I didn't know anything about them. I don't care. Loving kindness is sending love without looking for any kind of thing in reserve. I'll, I'll love you if you love me. No, I'll love you because you're there. And I'll help your mind to become more accepting. But I'm not going to tell you that that's what I'm doing. I'm not going to spend time trying to teach somebody else how to do it. They know. They feel it. So try to keep it going all day, all the time, no matter who you're with. So the lighter your mind can be during the day, the sharper your mindfulness will become. And the less you'll get caught in that identification that this is me, this is mine, this is who I am, you start developing your equanimity that balance of mind. And then eventually you'll get into a state of disenchantment where you can have this happy feeling and radiate this happy feeling without any attachments to it. Okay. Should anyone say that this is, oops, I lost my place. This is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience. I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with a fading away of joy, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, and still feeling happiness with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. So the keeping 
in the third jhana with your daily activities is a little bit more advanced than a lot of people when they're first starting out, but you can train yourself to have that equanimity, that disenchantment with likes and dislikes, the teaching yourself to be aware that your mind can be smiling all the time. Now, this doesn't say that there is tranquility with this, but there is. There is tranquility and equanimity and full awareness. You're still aware of everything around you. You know what's happening around you. You still hear sounds, but they don't pull your attention away. You can stay with what you're doing while you do it. Now, when I was going to the hospital every day, I spent a lot of time with both joy of the second jhana and equanimity of the third jhana. A lot of people would have very strong physical pain. And I found by doing the third jhana, the equanimity, the acceptance without resistance of the pain, the pain became less and less for them. And they began accepting the fact that, yeah, it's going to be there, so why fight it? That's one of the things that everybody does when pain, physical pain especially, but also mental pain, when it arises. I don't like it. I don't want it there. I want it to stop, but it doesn't. So you have to learn how to have that balance of mind that accepts the fact that, yes, there is painful feeling there. And when you stop fighting it, when you stop trying to make the feeling be the way you want it to be, then that resistance in your mind, that craving that I don't like it, begins to lessen. So there's a lot of real amazing things that you can do with your daily activities and being in a jhana. It's just not getting caught in the likes and dislikes of a feeling when it arises. Especially mental feeling, because that's a sneaky one. That's the one we've been going around all our lives, thinking that this dislike, that, that like, it's all me. And it makes everything happy or makes things worse, more sad. But when you can smile, even when you don't feel like smiling, there's benefit to that. <clears throat> They're doing a lot of studies on smiling right now, a huge amount of studies. And when you are smiling with your eyes, with your mouth, with your mind, with your heart, it changes the whole situation. It makes life a lot easier. Why is that? Because now you're letting go of the craving. Now you're seeing with a clear mind.
the six R's are amazingly helpful. And the problem that you have is trying to remember when you start getting caught. And that's why I'm saying, if you're in one of the jhanas, if you practice being in a jhana in your daily activities, you're not going to get caught. Now, what happens when you get to the third jhana, you don't notice your body so much. And if you're just starting out with your meditation, you're still a rookie. You haven't become an advanced meditator yet. That feeling in your heart is going to disappear and it's going to come up into your head. Now, when I send loving kindness, I'm sending it from here. I'm not sending it from my quote, heart. And my mind is much more pure at that time. So getting into the third jhana, this is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Should anyone say that this is the utmost joy, pleasure and joy that beings experience? I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain with the previous disappearance of joy and grief. Abandoning the pleasure and pain means the feeling in the body. The letting go of joy and grief, you've already let go of the joy. And joy and grief are two signs of the same coin. And that's where a lot of attachment is. A monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is where your equanimity gets very much stronger. And you can start using other words, not necessarily equanimity, but acceptance. Having a mind that's in very strong balance. Somebody can come up to you and slap you in the face and it doesn't make you react. Except maybe to say, don't do that again which has happened to me when I went to an airport. Somebody thought I was a Hare Krishna. And he came up and slapped me. I said, why'd you do that for? He said something about Hare Krishna and how they're always trying to get money out of you. And I said, well, I'm not a Hare Krishna, I'm a Buddhist. And I started talking to him a little bit about uh, the nonviolence of Buddhism and that sort of thing. And he wound up buying me a meal. So I got slapped for my meal. <laughs> okay, should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience. I would not concede that to him. Why is that? 
because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form. That means like when you're in the first jhana, second jhana, you still feel your hands, you still feel things in your body. When you get to this stage, you don't feel your body at all unless you put your attention on your body. You stay with the loving kindness and radiating loving kindness to all beings. And that's why I say a complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form. There's still subtle perceptions of form that can occur but they're mental. One time, this brings me up to a story, one of my teachers, he's a very world-renowned teacher Somebody asked him about the Eightfold Path. And he said, why do you always start with right view? I call it harmonious perspective. And he, the teacher didn't have the answer right off the top of his head. So he said, because that's the way the Buddha started the Eightfold Path, which is a completely unsatisfactory answer. He started the, the off the Eightfold Path with right view because the view that you really need to experience is the anatta view, the not-self view. Seeing things without any craving in your mind at all at that time. That's right view. Now, there can still be some sensations if there is contact with your body when you're in this realm. This realm that we're, we're going into is called infinite space with compassion. So if you don't put your attention on your body, you're not going to feel your body. But if there is contact, say some, some breeze comes up and you feel it, it's not going to make your attention waver. Or if there's a sound that comes up, it's not going to take your attention to it and, and make you wonder what to do with it. You're going to notice it, but that's all. So now you're getting into the mental realm where everything is much more subtle. It's not gross and big like physical feeling right now. Now, one of the things that is really amazing, and I had to work hard to convince my teacher, Usila Nanda, that I was right. And that is you can be in a mental realm and still be moving your body around. You can still be walking. You can still be doing things. And be in that realm, radiating compassion. But the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact A 
aware that space is infinite. Now, I, I put with compassion because I teach the Brahma Viharas. And that this is what it says in another sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya about infinite space is where you experience compassion. Video. Video. What are you talking about? Oh, video's not on. How'd that happen? Sorry, I didn't know that I, it turned off. So, you can be walking down the street in infinite space, just radiating this feeling out and out and out and out and radiating compassion at the same time. And actually it's kind of fun when you do it. But because you don't have feeling in the body, the only place you have feeling is the bottom of your feet where there's contact with walking. But you don't notice anything in between that and your head. It's really kind of odd. But it is kind of fun, too. This is that other kind of pleasure that's loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now, when you get to the fourth jhana and you have strong equanimity, this is where I will tell you that you have become an advanced meditator. And you let go of individual people and now you start radiating loving kindness to all beings in the six directions. And I'll explain that more whenever you get through that state or to that state. Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? because there is another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space with compassion, aware that consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of inf infinite consciousness with joy. Joy is mudita. There's a lot of people that have the idea that mudita is, um, they call it sympathetic joy, altruistic joy. And I don't really agree with that definition because that's outside your mind that's being joyful for other people if they're successful well that's a kind of joy yes and it's nice to use it yes but the kind of joy that mudita is is the all pervading joy it's the joy that is a very happy feeling without any excitement in it at all. Now, infinite consciousness is really interesting when you get to that state because as you're walking, as you're 
doing things, you start noticing consciousnesses arise and pass away. You start to notice this very fast flickering. And what you're seeing right now, because your mind is calmed down enough, what you're seeing is individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. This is called birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. The birth of a consciousness and it's fading away, it's death. But this happens so fast that we don't really recognize it as such. When you get to infinite consciousness, you actually start being more and more aware that everything is impermanent. We thought sounds and sights were were permanent while they were uh, arri while they were there. We don't realize that it's a continual arise and pass away, arise and pass away. So now when you get to this state, you start seeing very, very clearly that there is nothing in this world that is permanent. Everything is in a state of change. Also, you're seeing the unsatisfactoriness of this because there's, it's no quiet. It's just continual movement. And it gets tiresome. And you're also going to see very, very clearly that there is no controller. This happens because conditions are right for it to be seen. So you're seeing Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, up close and personal, and you're seeing that it's not some kind of philosophy. I know a lot of people that are studying the Satipatthana Sutta, they make a big deal out of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, but it's all mental. It's all thinking about. It's not actually experiencing. They experience on a very gross form. But when you get to this realm, it's very subtle. And you see the truth of it. So the next realm is nothingness with equanimity. I'm running out of time that I should be talking and that I should be asking questions. Oops, I really am out of time. I should be asking if, if you have any questions now. But this particular sutta is absolutely brilliant. Understand that feeling is more emotion, more mental than it is physical. Although physical can be big, it can really be there. But the more you start being aware of the Vedana changing from one thing to another, the more you're aware of the unsatisfactoriness of all of this sort of thing. Con continually moving around. And when you stop taking things personally, now you're starting to get to a very high realm of understanding where you're seeing the Dhamma as it actually is. It's not talk anymore. It's not a philosophy anymore. This is actually being able to see exactly how this stuff works. And you're teaching yourself to be able to recognize that. You're seeing it for yourself. 
So I really like this sutta because of that. Now, since I've been talking for a long time, do you have any questions? It doesn't matter whether it's on this Dhamma talk or you have a question that you want an answer to. If I possibly can help you, I will. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. I really liked it. Uh, and uh, just what you were saying, I uh, I think I have felt this uh, incessant distress, or I don't know if that's like anitsa kind of uh, feeling. So, so I've been wondering like how to cope with this feeling of uh, unsatisfactoriness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, this is where you find out it's really real. It's it's mm -hmm. just a a bunch of words that people use to make themselves try to understand. Hmm. actually seeing for yourself and you're teaching yourself that this stuff is real it's not a maybe mm -hmm. I wish there was more teachers that were actually able to see that for themselves so that they could teach that Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, uh, yeah. I suppose I. Mm. You can ask anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I just need to meditate more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was. Yeah. Well, I, I want you to have more fun too. <laughs> yeah. Don't get so serious with it. Yeah, I think that's one one thing I might have done too much yeah see the thing is if you try too much <clears throat> try too hard you put in too much energy too much effort and you wind up slowing your progress down mm. you want to do this with a light mind a smiling mind mm. a mind that's willing not to try to make things be the way you want them to be but laugh and have fun with them. That's the way it actually is. Hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. Any other question? Uh, Bhante? Yeah. Uh, hi, Bhante. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, first one is... Uh, in the talk, you were saying that you practice uh, second jhana or third jhana and you send loving kindness through your head. Right. Can you clarify that? Uh, like usually we practice uh, third jhana by sending loving kindness through the heart, right? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. But once you get into the arupa jhanas, you can start doing it in any jhana. Through the head. That clarifies me. Okay. Yeah. And? <laughs> Actually, uh, my the, the reason I asked the first question was, uh, I felt like I tried to radiate loving kindness through my chest, but I was feeling uncomfortable with that. Yeah, and you can hurt yourself with that. Do it through your head. Okay. 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 And my second question is, uh, it is as asking out of curiosity. Uh, like when we say about divine eye or divine ear, is it developed by itself or is there some practice? Well, that that's kind of a, a tricky question because it depends. There's there's three different kinds of beings. Okay. There's a being that is very, very intellectual, but not very sensitive to feeling. There's a being that is very sensitive to feeling, but not so intellectual. 
And then there's a being like the Buddha that was both. He was highly intellectual and he was highly sensitive. Now, a lot of people are like the Buddha, not to the same degree as the Buddha, of course, but they are sensitive to feeling and they're intelligent. Now, it depends on their sensitivity. No, Sariputta was not sensitive to feeling at all, but he was highly intelligent. My teacher, Usilananda, he could not understand the instructions I give for loving kindness because he was so intellectual. The only thing, the only way he would teach loving kindness was through guided meditation. And that's helpful for some people. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it's just that he wasn't so sensitive to feeling. Now, I was living with another monk, his name was Usobana. Sobana means happy, so, and the U is Mr., so he was Mr. Happy. And he was very sensitive to feeling, and he could radiate loving kindness, and I would be outside and I would feel it. It, it, if you're sensitive to feeling, the divine ear and the divine eye will happen by themselves. There's no meditation that I know of, and that's not to say that I'm the all-knowing uh, teacher. Other people might be able to teach people how to do that, but I've never run across anybody that has. I do have students that they have the divine eye. They can see devas and, and brahmas and they, they can communicate with them. I, I've told this story a few times. I was with this one lady and she had the divine eye and divine ear and I asked her to go see my mother, who was in California at the time. And I asked her what town she was in. I asked her what the street name was that she lived on. I asked her for the address. And then I asked her what color clothing was she wearing. And she said all the, she did it. I lived on 8th Avenue. She said it was it was 8. My, my mother was at home. I called her up and I asked her what color her clothes were. And they were blue. She was, had a blue suit on that day. I was pretty much amazed and she did have that divine eye. And she was able to communicate with Davis. And Brahmas. Every now and then she'd go to a Brahma realm and ask them, what kind of meditation are you doing? The Brahma realm, according to the suttas, <coughs> they use as their nourishment, they use joy. So she would always ask them, what kind of meditation you're doing? And they're doing something that has to do with joy. The Deva Loka, they eat grapes. They just appear before them. So you, you go to visit one of the, those uh, Deva Lokas and you see the devas sitting around munching on grapes, thinking about this or that, or singing and dancing and doing all kinds of fun stuff. They do that in the deva loka, not so much in the brahma loka. But from everybody that I've taught, I've never known anyone to make the determination to develop the divine ear or divine eye. 
It just happened for them. And they're pretty amazed when it happens and they don't believe it at first. But the divine eye, they can see somebody on the other side of the planet. It's like going to visit them, see what they're doing. The divine ear, they can hear people talking on the other side of the planet which the government would love. <laughs> but uh, also, when, when that starts to happen, you, you have the ability to uh, read minds. And I know an awful lot of people, oh, I want to be able to read everybody's mind. And my, my thoughts on that is, why? They're just as screwed up as I am. I don't need I don't need their garbage in and garbage out. But there are there are some people that can do that. All they all they do is point their mind in the direction they want to go and they can they can have that happen for them. It does take practice. Just like if you go to, if, if you experience the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and then you want to do it again after you've become an anagami, it takes practice. Um, start at 10 minutes to try to hit it exactly, and then extend the time until you're sitting for two days, three days, four days, like that. You do have to put a limit on, on the time that you sit in the cessation like that, seven days. I've only met one, one uh, teacher that could do that. That was Deepama. But there are some people around that are quite good at being able to get in and out. They just don't have the time to take to uh, do that. They're laymen, so they still have worldly things that they have to do. Anyway, does anybody else have a question? Yes, I do, Bhante. Hello. 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 Uh, I was wondering about um, the loss of attainment that could happen and the loss of attainment that can happen. So there is eight stages until full fruition or full freedom. Right. And I was wondering how can one lock in one stage of an attainment? Because I've just I never use it heard of by that. Learning how to have mastery of going in and out of that jhana. Hmm. It takes practice. But you make a determination. Let's say you want to get to the second jhana. You, you make a determination to be in that jhana for a period of time. And that you don't go any higher than that jhana. Bhante, I'm specifically talking about Sotapanna or locking in that that attainment with morality or... Uh, that locks in pretty much by itself. Oh, okay. And if you do happen to break up, you're going to feel very, very guilty. Mm. And you need to find a spiritual friend and tell them that you broke the precept and take the precepts again. Mm. Okay? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you, Bansé, for your talk. Um, yeah. You were talking a little bit earlier about sadness. Yeah. And I was, um, is sadness a sign that we're attached, that we have some kind of attachment? No, it's a sign that there's a painful feeling that's there. And it we can, just, it can be that you're attached to it. Most people are. 
because they don't like that feeling. And they indulge in the feeling and they try to think the feeling away. But feelings are one thing and thoughts are something else and it doesn't work. So you wind up indulging in the thoughts and dissatisfaction of that sadness feeling. And you're identifying with it and you're trying to control it and it only, it only makes it bigger and more intense. So if we, if, if we feel sad because we lost a friend, we just allow the sadness to be there because it's a feeling. Well, you have to allow the sadness to be there because the truth is it's there. But don't fight with it. Don't try to push it away. Allow that sadness to run its course on its own without you trying to control it. Okay. I've had family members die for my whole life and uh, the sadness was really tearing me apart. A lot of people, they don't realize that sadness is part of grief. Okay, grief can manifest in many ways. Some people it manifests as anger, some anxiety, a lot in indulging in the dislike of that painful feeling. But allowing that feeling to be there, let it tear your heart out. Don't take it personally. It's a feeling that is there and it will run its course as you soften your mind and allow it to be there without trying to control it. Feel the sadness, let it be there, and eventually it'll just run its course. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been around a lot of people that have death in the family, and that's one of the things that I tell them is that they have to allow that feeling, that sadness to be there. If they don't allow it, in two years, they're going to have some kind of major physical problem. But I also tell people that stop indulging in that sadness. Start radiating loving kindness to other friends or family members that are caught up in it so they can let it go more quickly. See, a, a, a statement that I use a lot is you never have to feel hopeless or helpless. You radiate loving kindness. Open up your heart and allow that feeling for them to help them overcome their sadness. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Happy New Year. Okay. Una? Uma. Hello, Bante. Omar. Hello. Oh, yes, Bante. Yeah. I would like to ask you that for developing collectedness of the mind, what would you say about the method of the Thai forest master, Ajahn Lee? I would say that he didn't understand what craving actually is. I know of Ajahn Lee. He, does, he didn't understand that it's a tension and tightness in your mind and body. He developed a kind of one-pointed concentration. And that's what he taught. One-pointed concentration does not overcome craving. And that's why it turns into one-pointed concentration. You can get very deeply concentrated, but that does not lead you to getting off the wheel of sansara. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? Uma? 
Hello? Yes, yes, I'm here. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, Bhante, but a few days ago when I was trying the method, I didn't feel there to be any one-pointed concentration at all. And I was feeling very relaxed in the body and the mind, actually. But you did not in intentionally relax. That's just one of the point. One of the things that happens with one-pointed concentration. You can feel very much mm -hmm. at ease, but there's still some tension and tightness in your mind and in your body that you don't notice because you haven't practiced recognizing it. That's what the six R's are all about. Any Did you say one-pointed. Well, yeah, it is a one point concentration is at a spot in the body. Yeah. The thing is, if you don't recognize the tension and tightness in your mind and in your body, you'll ignore it. You have to have a sharper kind of mindfulness that you can see that. I know a lot of people that are very happy with the one-pointed kinds of concentration, and I, there's nothing wrong with it, except what is the end result? The end result that I'm most interested in is getting off of the wheel of sansara. A lot of people, they really get hooked on the, the and one, one point of concentration can be, take many forms. But if it doesn't have that relaxed step in it, that's an intentional, that intentional relaxed step. If it doesn't have that in it, you're not letting go of the craving. This is why the six R's are so incredibly important. Your experiences might be similar to somebody that is letting go of the craving, but it's not going to be exact. And you're only going to be able to go so high. Okay, so in the suttas, when the Buddha says, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body, so what does that mean? Does it mean we feel the body from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet? Well, you know that it's there. It's the right, so just a general whole body awareness. It's the next part of the instruction that you're not saying. Tranquilize the bodily formation on the in-breath and on the out-breath. That's the part mm. that is missing. If you don't relax on the in-breath and relax on the out-breath, you're not letting go of the craving. And it is subtle. And I had 20 years of doing the kind of practice that you're talking about. And I have experienced a lot of tranquility and I have experienced a lot of wonderful different states. But I was never satisfied with the end result. Because I didn't feel any real personality development when I started noticing and, and started doing the tranquilize the bodily formation on the in-breath and out-breath, when I started doing that, I started noticing a lot of changes that were happening. And my mindfulness was much sharper. Now with one-pointed concentration or access concentration, you can get to a place where it suppresses hindrances and you think you're really do, doing good. But when you get out of that concentration state, you still have the same old 
habitual attachments to feelings. There's no real personality development. Okay? Yes, yes. One final question, Bhante. Okay. Well, what would you say is this, what people call the knower or the knowing? Well, <clears throat> it depends on you personally. And the reason I'm saying that is that how are you teaching yourself with a direct experience or are you trying to think it and know it? Do you see what I'm saying? Direct experience. When, when uh, I was talking about being an infinite consciousness, an awful lot of people, they, they think about impermanent suffering in that self without seeing it. They, they can talk about it a lot, but when they see it for themselves, they know that it's real. And that's what, what I'm teaching is, is different than any of the Burmese or any of the Thai that I know of. It's different from what they're teaching just because of that relax on the in-breath, relax on the out-breath. And if you don't have that, your mind tends towards uh, one-pointed concentration. Although it might not feel like it's any kind of special concentration, it is because eventually you'll get to a place where your hindrances are suppressed. And you think, well, this is good. This is really nice. And it is while you're in that state. But are you able to carry that state around with you all the time? And the answer is no. You still have the same amount of dissatisfaction and dislike. <coughs> you still have the same attachment to lusts of one kind or another. So, what I'm trying to show you with this six R's is how to change and develop so that your mind becomes more and more wholesome all the time. Okay? Yes. Yes, thank you, Mante. Okay, anything else? Bante, one, one quick question. Would it be fair to say that the advantage of practicing metta and the six R's over one-pointed concentration is that we can be in jhana throughout the day, whereas yes. practice is one-pointed, you can't be in jhana throughout the day when with your daily activities? Right. Is that accurate? There, there is that too, but the main difference is the relaxed step. See, and, and I've explained this many times in many, many talks. As soon as you relax, you don't have any distraction in your mind at that time. Your mind is pure because you've let go of that craving. And to have a mind that's really bright and really alert and clear without any distractions pulling it away is amazing. And I was truly amazed when I started doing that at seeing how fast my progress was in the meditation and how easy it became. 
I was very, very pleasantly surprised because I was used to doing hard meditation where there was a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and all of a sudden my mind is light and alert and uplifted. Oh, this is nice. And that's one of the things that happens, especially with the Brahma Viharas, the way I'm teaching it. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Anybody else? Dante, uh, Christoph here. I have a, a quick question uh, on a sutta that explains the five khandhas, um, the Samyutta Nikaya, and um, pretty fine with almost any, uh, all of it, but in the, it says here, with the arising of name and form, there's the arising of consciousness. That okay. is, that's, uh, they call it Nama Rupa. And oh, okay. Bhikkhu Bodhi used name and form in some parts of his uh, uh, translation, and in other parts he called it Mentality, materiality. It's formations. Okay. So, so that I can just replace name and form with formations? Yeah, that works. Can we it again? Okay. All right, I'll do that and see how, how, I get, how, I've, how it makes sense then. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Ardika? You look like you have a question. Well, actually, it's because the, you just said, like, the mentality and materiality is formations. I thought that formations and, well, it's a different thing. I mean, like, formation is Sankara, right? But Sankara it, is a part it, of... It can be. Okay. But mentality and materiality is the best definition for it. Formations is mind, body, uh, and and speech. Okay. Are you awake? <laughs> I am, Bonte. Actually, I'm wide awake. Okay, just making sure. You're, I know it's like 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock there. Well, I'm wide awake because I just, um, I'm just i doing a private retreat right now, actually. Oh, good for you. So that's why I'm pretty wide awake right now. I can't sleep. So if you have any questions, you write to us. How to fly, Bante? <laughs> It's the air element. That's all I'll tell you. <clears throat> uh, how to actually observe the motion, Bhante, of the air? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it has to do with movement and vibration. movement and vibrations because well actually lately i was reading this book by lady sayadaw actually he was talking about the four elements and it seems like the understanding of the four elements is not exactly as how we actually see the elements as it is like let's say it's like the earth actually i thought it was like something like the soil or something that is um solid right but it, it's soft and hard yeah soft and hard that is actually something that i just understand but it's actually soft and hard right and and uh, the elements the physical elements that we have are a combination of all the elements mixed together in different proportions right like a physical body is different than a rock but it has all of the elements in it mm -hmm. then how are we gonna be able to actually make the water solid 
put it in the refrigerator where the freezer is and wait. <laughs> oh, okay, one thing. <laughs> Yeah, you can walk on the water here. Come here. Because it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to walk on the water, we have it. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can even glide on it, get some skates. It's nice. Sounds <laughs> nice. Oh, well. How's everything going in Malaysia or Indonesia? It's pretty cold right now, but um, probably it's not as cold as in there, for what, sure. What, what is pretty cold for you right now? Raining. It's, um, I think it's um, still 10th degree or 15 degree, or 15 degree <laughs> Celsius. Yeah. Well, it's it's minus that here. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, actually, yesterday we had snow on the on the ground. Mm, that's nice. And it lasted almost till afternoon, and then it was all gone. Just Can you send them here, Bunsy? Huh? Can you send them here? <laughs> well, work with the elements and see if you can do it yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I need more instructions, actually. Oh, well. Patience. That's... that's it takes a while and it depends on your sensitivity to the elements themselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think that I should have a very, um, like a very, a, a kind of have, need to have an equanimity so that I will be able to do it. <sighs> Not sure. I'm, I'm not going to talk much about doing this kind of stuff over the uh, the internet. Okay, but no, so no, are we going to have a private session? You come here for ten years, and we'll work on it. I'll no. show you how to do it. Okay. <laughs> okay, Monte. <laughs> oh, you have to let go of a lot of. things the way you think they are. You have to let go, of, and it, it, ta it takes a while. It really does. Yeah. So anybody else have a question? So, Dante, one, uh, one last question on my side. Um, when the cessation happens, the, the, the knowledge of the past, um, is it possible uh, that the fruition doesn't happen and the time yeah, lapse? It doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with fruition. It has to do with your memory and your sensitivity to feelings. Can you elaborate on that? Ten years ago, are you the same person then that you are now? No. Oh, that was a past lifetime, wasn't it? <laughs> right. Okay, it has to do with memory. And you keep going back and back until you start remembering past lifetimes. I've taught this to a few people. Okay. <clears throat> So is it possible that you lose that estate and you don't continue practicing or break some precepts and you go back to lower or upper jhanas or the lower jhanas and 
is it harder to go back? No. You have to forgive, make a determination not to do it again, and then all of your ability in going in and out of jhana will occur on its own very quickly. It's the guilty feeling of breaking a precept. And the, when you break the precept, you have a tendency to take it pers personally. I said this, I did this, I made a mistake. And that's where the attachment is. So when you uh, confess it to someone else, Right. Oh, it sounds like David and Stan. Sounds like we lost them. Uh, Bante, can you unmute yourself? Bante or David, we cannot hear you. We can hear or you. Don't... Okay. So there. somebody is messing with the Zoom. Join our Zoom meeting. No, we can, I can hear you and see you now. Okay. Anyway, if you want to learn about past lifetimes, you have to have very, very strong equanimity because there are some things that we've done in past lifetimes that we're really not very happy about, and we have to learn to forgive those. Right. And it can be freaky. Some of the things that we've done can really be bad and harmed other people. And you have to have equanimity and acceptance in, in your... Uh, in, in your... Uh, mind. Okay. So is it possible that after the um, attaining the knowledge of the past, all these feelings comes up and you put well, the, the meditation then aside? Deal with them. Then you need to deal with them. I have a friend that he had a memory of the past of killing someone and then getting stabbed in the liver and died. And he kept having this same memory over and over again. And he asked me what to do. And I said, now you have to pra practice forgiveness. You have to ask the man that you killed before if he would forgive you. And you have to forgive the person that stabbed and killed you in that lifetime. Uh, his whole life he had had a bad liver. And as soon as he forgave that person for killing him in that lifetime, his liver problems went away. Right. So that can happen. But you need to be around a teacher to help keep your balance with the uh, memories. It's and more have, about the you sorry, have go ahead. strong equanimity. Right. No, it's more about uh, this lifetime. I mean, <clears throat> of course, before getting to know you and David, it's just a matter of experiencing that. But not knowing that, you just put it aside and you see it and say, so the life is what it is. Doesn't everything is empty and non self? And so, what is the point of? Well, that's philosophy, yeah. 
But what, what we're more interested here with this group is the actual experience. Mm. Okay. This right. is real important because it goes beyond philosophy. When you, when you start seeing Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta for real, it changes the way you see the world. But an awful lot of people, they're told from the very beginning, everything is impermanent, everything is suffering. And they just repeat those words over and over again without actually seeing them. So it's a real important thing that you experience this. Now, a right. lot of people that come here for retreat, in a 10-day retreat, they will be able to experience that. I'm not saying everyone, but it depends on you and how, how you follow instructions and how you teach yourself. Okay? Right, thank you. Okay. One day I have a last, one, one more question, sorry. Okay. Uh, is it possible to change the elements from one to another, basic elements? I, I didn't hear what the... Is it, is it possible to change the basic elements? Oh, it's you're changing your perspective of the elements that... I mean, uh, this is not magic, okay? My camera's off? It doesn't say that here. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, you don't actually change the elements. The elements are the elements. They, they're, they're always there. It's, it's just changing your perspective and use of the elements. That's why it takes about 10 years to be able to really do, do this. It's not an easy thing. Now you can walk through a wall if you change your perspective of what was there. But if you try that now, you wind up with a sore nose, right? So, if there's no more questions, why don't we share some merit? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So all of you have a good week and have fun. Keep the smiling going, okay? Thank you, Bhante. Bhante. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, David.